Hello and welcome to One on One. I'm Vernon Ramasan. I'm very pleased to say my guest today is Chief Ricardo Barrett Hernandez, who is a food consultant for a new book, Kunawata, and of course also president of the Santa Rosa First Peoples Carib Community. Chief, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I wish you luck to see the book here. Fascinating book, a lot of work went in it by Satbal Karan Singh, and you have of course consulted on it, and of course you're an expert in the area. So I'm very pleased to have you here. I don't think I've ever had a guest on to discuss the subject of our indigenous people from the actual community. Okay. So it's a great honor to have you here. It's nice to be here. Yes. Now, I think, well, I think, first of all, the, we're talking about it just now, the decade for indigenous peoples as declared by the UN is end, ended this year. It is, yes. This is the last year of the decade. I have to ask you, in, in the decade, have we seen any progress in terms of the country showing greater respect or providing better facilities or more financing for work being done by the community? Certainly. Uh, first, here in Trinidad and Tobago, we have seen the appointment of a cabinet committee, appointed committee, to deal with the issues affecting the First Peoples of Trinidad. And we have received increased funding for our activities for our Heritage Week, in, which is in, held in the month of October, over a 70 day period. And also for the Santa Rosa Festival, which is in the month of That's August. That's a signaled event for the community. It is, every indeed. year. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose if you ask the average person in Trinidad and Tobago, they, they would have a sort of a basic school knowledge of the indigenous people, the first peoples. Um, much of it would be wrong. Yes. I think we were always schooled to think that you know the Arawaks were the peaceful people, the Caribs were the warlike, warlike people, people, and that was the end of that. And yes. you know, it's yes. a long time ago. Nothing's happened since, and they're all finished. Mm -hmm. That's of course not the case. It's not. And it's important that you and your community, and people like Sat Balkaran Singh, sort of draw attention to the fact that there is an active culture and it's being kept alive for very good reason, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Um, as part of the, 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 the year by the United Nations, also we are um, addressing the issue of the curriculum in schools. On that committee, there is a representative from the Ministry of Education and they have included in the curriculum aspects of study for the first people. So we have seen an increase in interest from the school population and even the adult population in visiting the center, in seeking out information because you know it is a requirement that they must use in their studies and so. So we have also seen that added uh, contribution in terms of what a decade you can say we have achieved within this decade. And in mm -hmm. terms of our national, so our psyche when it comes to history, we have a pretty sort of poor track record, don't we? We don't really care about the past that much. Exactly, And, yes. and that, that perhaps mm -hmm. is why we're not very grounded as we move into the future. Yes, yes. Well, um, that is one of the problems and I think they are moved to to address that. In the same committee that I talked about, that cabinet appointed committee, all these are issues that have been discussed and we are trying to find ways and means of reaching out and educating the people. There is another committee, as you know, reparations is in the air. Mm -hmm. And this reparation is also at the national committees, a cabinet appointed committee that has to deal with the issue of native genocide and African enslavement. And also some of these issues are being discussed here. The, the, the issue of, of the history of education is a vital part um, in order to achieve the goals you know, set by the reparation committee. So pretty soon I think the committee will be embarking on public consultations where they will seek to educate um, the rest of the population on the history and what the reparations is all about. I know a lot of people seem to find it almost fashionable to sort of minimize um, the actual Carib presence in Trinidad and Tobago. They say, well, you know, they might have two drops of Carib blood, yes. but that don't really make them Carib. How, how do you respond to that? I mean, Well, and that is so. There are quite a lot of people in Trinidad who have Carib blood, as you say, or, or First Peoples blood. We, we like to move away from the we don't know whether which, Carib, yes. which exactly, yeah. And just recently we did, we, the Santa Rosa Carib community participated in a project from a university in Pennsylvania doing the, the testing, the DNA testing and so. And they have found significant um, percentage of indigenous blood in, in the First Peoples of Arima. We have extended that to the Lopino area. And they are willing to come back so that they can share it with the rest of the country so that people um, who are interested can participate. The thing about it is that the people in Arima, we know that we have mixed ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But those who identify with their First Peoples heritage are very proud of it because we have been able to keep a continuity from the establishment of the mission in the 1700s in Arima to the present day. Um, and, and I think the colonizers um, deliberately had the mixing of the First Peoples 
um, so that today we can have what some people consider to be a watered down version of this people so that so that claims to to rights of indigenous peoples that they could be denied but the united nations declaration on the rights of indigenous people recognizing that have made it clear in their declaration that people um, who claim whatever indigenous um, blood or ancestry or part of it they have the right as any other full-blooded indigenous person. And in any case, so, as you mentioned, you had DNA tests done. Yes. And there were significant levels of, of, Certainly. of first yeah. people's blood yes. in the community. Yes. Uh, I, I guess as we go throughout the Caribbean, Dominica would also have a significant Caribbean Yes, well, six, Dom, Dom, Dominica, they, they have been able to keep uh, the purity in the bloodline much more than, than us because they They're managed... a much more rugged country as well. They, yeah. they, uh, but they managed to retain the reservation where only the, the, the Carib people live. Whereas in Arima, that right was lost in the 1800s, mm -hmm. so that you had more mixing and different peoples coming into Arima, so you have a greater percentage of mixture. Whereas, as I say in Dominica, it was restricted only, although that they have mixing today, but they have been able to retain that level of purity you know, to a higher degree. But I think it's wonderful because I have some friends who, who do claim um, First Peoples ancestry yes. partly, and, and they're very proud of it. Yes. And, and I think it's, it's the same way you see like in the US, uh, for example, people being very proud of having Cherokee ancestry and things like that, even though they may have had other groups mixed in, yes. they still yes. hold on to that part to of it. To that them. part of it. Because yes. I guess it, it ties into the land, doesn't it? Certainly, certainly. Is, is yes. that one of the reasons that we, it's important that we do observe our First Peoples? Because they sort of show us where we are really are officially tied to the land of, the of, land. of Kairi, I guess. Yes. No, in, yes. in terms of preserving the culture, it's a sort of an interesting balancing act, isn't it? You don't, you don't want to be seen as performing quaint rituals. You want it to be a living thing, I imagine. Of course, of course. Um, today, we, we see even, you know, the church, because, you know, the first peoples were, first of all, Hispanized and they were Christianized, they, 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 they were converted from their original way of life, their spirituality and so on to the Catholic Christian doctrine. And in the very early days it was forbidden for, for people of indigenous descent to practice that spirituality because it was seen as pagan, as not Christian and so on. So that contributed to the demise of that part of the culture. But bits and pieces remained and, and most of the elders practice it in secret. Today because of what we would see, um, you know, the times we live in, more knowledge and so on, people are coming out, we are practicing our rituals in open, and even sometime you have some of the, the well, there was a, one particular priest in Arima who actually participated, because it is similar to what the church do, mm -hmm. does. It's just that people need to be educated and the meaning of it, what you're doing, what, 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 does, what it really means so that people will not be ignorant of the true meaning of their spirituality. No, I, I want to get to the food in a while, but there's so many other yeah. areas I want to touch on. And as you mentioned, some of the rituals, which are very important to any sort of First Peoples anywhere, yes. but because of the mists of time, mm -hmm. things sort of get changed a little bit, you're not quite sure. Are, are we fairly certain that the rituals that are practiced, let's say the water festival, mm -hmm. would those be in keeping, are we sure, with the original practices of, of, of the First Peoples? The, because of the time that we are talking about, 1600, 1700 to today, there would have been some changes. Mm -hmm. There might be some other elements of other ethnic spirituality incorporated in there. I cannot be 100% certain. Mm -hmm. But to the best of our knowledge, what we do is what we have been inherited from the ancestors, what was passed on. So if there is any mixing there, if it is not 100%, we are not totally responsible. But as I say, we do what was passed on to us, and you know, to the best of your knowledge, that the best in keeping yes. the tradition. And what what is fascinating as well, especially with the first um, people's community in Arima, is, is the whole Santa Rosa festival, because that is a, a fascinating blending. As only you get a place like that, where you've got Christianity, Catholicism mixed in, mixed in with the original, with the original indigenous beliefs. Yeah. beliefs. Certainly, and a lot of people do not know this part of Santa Rosa festival. They because people think it's a purely Catholic festival, Catholic but festival. it's mixed up, isn't it's it? It's not. For instance, the, the Santa Rosa festival starts on the 1st of August. Even before we had emancipation as a public holiday in Trinidad on the 1st of August, it was a special day for the First Peoples. That is the day that the conch shell will be blown as to summon the people. The, the, the 1st of August is here. They would come out, they would have their rituals, their prayers and so on. And then they would sit to decide on the work, the preparation work for the festival. Men had their specific duties, the women had theirs, 
and they all did this leading up to this Santa Rosa festival. So it spanned over the over a month, the period of a month. It is not just one day going to church, having a mass, having a procession, and that's it. The indigenous people, within that month, there are different rituals that are being done leading up to the actual day of the feast. You know, so it is as you say, it is a mixture of the original beliefs with the Catholic tradition. We, we have much to learn from the sort of original beliefs of, of our first peoples, don't we, in terms yes. of how we interact with nature and, and the world around us. Exactly. The spirituality of the first peoples is based on nature. They are nature people of nature. And, and if, so if you believe there's an inherent spirituality in nature and it is worth sometimes worshipping or certainly appreciating, then you hold it as, as valuable. Certainly. You don't think of it as a commodity. Certainly, yeah. Uh, how do you get that message out to the wider community then? That well, we have things to learn from those who came before us. In the, that is why we believe that it, it is important today when we actually perform the rituals that we explain the, in the process. There is an explanation of what is being done, what is the meaning of it, so that, as I say, people can understand. So that you just don't perform a ritual without any explanation and people are left wondering. It is explained so that through that process of explaining, we hope that people would understand and appreciate. Now, one of the phenomena I've noticed over the last uh, couple of decades is the fact that, and I think perhaps technology helps with this, is the fact that you have First Peoples groups from various parts of this hemisphere yes. coming together to experience the commonalities that existed between the First Peoples in various parts, yes. ranging from all the way to Canada, all the way down into deep South America. Yeah. It, it, obviously, your community is part of that interaction as well, isn't it? Yes, we are part of the interaction. As a matter of fact, Trinidad is leading. We, 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 are, we have the smallest indigenous community. How large is it, by the way? Um, in Arima, the descendants number about 700. But okay. there are people of indigenous descent throughout Trinidad. Of course. Um, not all of them are active in the community in Arima. They would come out for special occasions. But we have the smallest in terms, when you compare to Dominica, when you compare to Guyana and all these other places, there are large indigenous communities. But we have been leading the way in bringing the groups together. Trinidad now holds the, the chair of the Caribbean Organization of Indigenous Peoples. There are about six countries belonging to this organization. And we take the opportunity to meet at this Heritage Festival to have dialogue on what is happening in the indigenous con communities in the respective countries. So we are, we are leading the way. One person remarked at this year, say, well, we have so, so much indigenous people in our, our country, but we don't have a, all this activity that you mm -hmm. have. Eight days, how do you do it? You know, we may have one day observance or something, two days for the most, and that is it. So they, they really marvel of what we have been able to do and, ver and appreciate um, Trinidad leading the way in bringing these people together so that we can continue to keep the fire of the indigenous flame. Well, perhaps that's a function of your small size because you, <laughs> you do tend to feel threatened. Listen, there's only so many of us going <laughs> to make sure this thing stays alive, right? Yes. How, how do you deal with the issue of the original languages that would have been? Okay, um, we take the opportunity to do workshops at every um, session of the heritage and uh, we have capacity building workshops in language, in spirituality, in music, in dance and things of that nature. And what we have retained in Trinidad is not a conversational language as Spanish or French or mm -hmm. something, but we have a lot of words that we have retained. And we have now identified those words are really Lokono or Arawak words. And as a result of that, we keep these um, cap capacity building classes in the language, mainly in the Arawak language. Well, why is that? I have been asking the historians and the anthropologists and archaeologists well, we and so on. We have to ask that too when, you come, when we get <laughs> because, because they label the community Carib community, but yet still the words that remain in the community are Arawak words. But on that, what we have discovered is that there was a point in time when the authorities labeled all peoples of indigenous descent as Caribs. Whether you belong oh. to the Carinia, the Lokono, the Warao, the Chinese, or whatever nation. And this is one of the reasons that the community in Arima we have moved to change the name from Carib community to First Peoples community. Because the I see a Carib there in brackets, but I mean, in, in it's, brackets, it's not yeah. the main part. Yeah, yeah because, because the, the history clearly states that when the mission in Arima was established in 1785, that the communities they, they took they were the communities from Cora, Arauca, and Takarigua. And there were different um, ethnic groups. There were the Nipuyos, which is one nation, the Carinians which is the Caribs, the Lokono, the Arawaks, the Chinese, and they all placed them in Arima. So you did not have in, a, have in Arima 
one particular indigenous nation. You had a mixture of these different nations. So that is why we find it's more appropriate to use the word first people. I, I guess we see that in, uh, around the world where colonizers tend to hold first peoples in contempt yes. in hi historical terms and just lump them all together into one big group, one ignoring big the fact that they're completely different, different groups that just happen to be occupying parts of the same land. Yes, yes. So there's no different here in Trinidad, same experience. Is, is there enough historical record right now for us to sort of rebuild to some extent what, what Trinidad and Tobago was like before yes, colonizers and, reached? And, and Dr. Balkaran Singh has come on board as an advisor to the Santa Rosa First Peoples and he is now working on a plan, a master plan, um, to, develop, to develop a First Peoples village in Arima. You know we have been allocated mm -hmm. a small portion of land, 25 acres, and uh, this is the vision for that area where we can recreate. Kind of sad considering at one point you had all the acres, but <laughs> down to 25 now, that's not yes, very yes. good. Isn't but it? at, le at least it's a start. It's something, it's and, start and you can sort of build a community yeah. and let the national community be, realize it's part of who they are as well. Yes. And yeah. that, that's the wonderful thing about Trinidad and Tobago, isn't it? We're all sort of so mixed up that it's likely that pretty well all of us have at some, some level some level of first people's blood and, in us. And we'll appreciate, we'll appreciate the efforts of the, of the first people, yes. Uh, and, and I guess still today, one part of our heritage is the fact that so many of our place names are derived from the first people's names. Certainly. So including Arima, I guess. Yes, yeah. yes, Arima. Napa Arima. Um, Napa Arima, Aruka, Tonapona, um, Karapichaima, quite a lot, quite a lot. Tamana. Would that be an indication that those areas were sort of areas of, of settlement? Of yes, land? yes, they were. So even somewhere like Kufa for in, in Central, which you would never think of as being. Shaguanas. Shaguanas, as well. Shaguanas yeah. is an indigenous name. And um, Professor Samaru has researched that there were the Shaguanis who lived there, but they were wiped out at some point in time, hence the name Shagwana. And I think I heard somewhere that the actual, where the main one is now was a trail it that was, they would have used. certainly, yes. It's fascinating yes. when you think about it. Well, let's get on to one of the contributions you made to this book, which was food. Yes. Because I was just summing through, and some of the things I thought were, you know, from some other part of the world, apparently are not from some other part of the world, they're from right here. And you've got some marvelous recipes, and I know you yourself prepare these things. Yes, some of them, I, yes, I do. Which I guess yes. makes it interesting for First Peoples, because there, there wasn't the sort of division necessary that men would cook, wouldn't they? You well, in the, in, in, the very, in the very early days, very, very early days, they, they, they had specific duties. Men had their specific duties, the women. But that has changed. Um, in, in major indi indigenous communities, you have men helping the women, preparing cassava, and many of the other things that they do. So it, it, there's no hard and fast rule as to who should do what. You know, as we develop and as we go along, all peoples, I think, have moved from one stage to the next. No, I guess a lot of these recipes would be, to some extent, fusion recipes, wouldn't they? They'd be influenced by Spanish influence in the yes, mainland. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a no, there's no way of telling how, how fully first people it is or what, to what level. Well, for Spanish instance, the things we, the, 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 what we call pastel in Trinidad, in yeah. Spanish, we'll say ayaca, which means... And I just passed the pastel recipe. Which, which means some from here and some from there. Um, the Spanish would have had their input in the pastels as we know it today with some of the ingredients that, that is used. But the original, the corn, like, like the indigenous people make a pastel only from corn, which is grated corn and mm. meat, you know, with flavored spice, some spices and so on. But there are a lot of things added to pastel today that will no doubt be Spanish. So that is why pastels is a mixture of the old. So the basis would have been uh, uh, indigenous, first people's, indigenous first peoples, and then we would then have had other influences Spanish coming influence, in, yes. which yes. Tend, tends to yeah. happen with food in general. Yes. Now, in terms of the staples of, of the first people, I guess cassava would cassava have been. Cassava is one, and for, for these parts, for, for South America, the Caribbean, cassava is one, number one, corn, second to cassava, um, and then you had some ground provisions, other ground provisions such as certain types of yams and potatoes, beans, there were certain type of beans, of course not all the varieties we have today, mm -hmm. but there were one or two beans. Palm trees, some of the palms provided the vegetables, the, the heart of it. And um, of course fish and uh, wild meat form the basic um, structure of first people's food and so. And around that they would have built an entire sort of diet. And also I guess whatever was convenient in terms of shellfish would have been fish, popular yeah, as well. Yeah, I know, yeah. one, of the knows, one of the ways that archaeologists identify areas is by the middens. By the middens, of where course. Where they see the shellfish. That's right. Because yeah. my dad had a degree in archaeology, so we used to sort of go around looking for middens when I was a kid. Okay. So something yeah. like, let's say we take a kind of like cassava pole. Mm -hmm. That has an indigenous uh, it, 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 it has an indigenous because, because most of the ingredients, again, it comes from the indigenous. Pumpkin is indigenous. 
the, the cassava, of course, coconut is not, it came in after. And uh, the, the indigenous people who lived two, three hundred years ago might not have made porn in that form. But, um, so it, it's a development. Yeah. People might realize that coconut actually is not something that we always had. Yes, that's, that's what we understand from... from the I, I gather even the Mayaro sort of coconut estate was because of a shipwreck somewhere and the things washed ashore. Yes. And, and some of the foods that people don't realize are from this part of the world are things like, like tomatoes. Yes. They're, part, they're a new world crop. And Crops. in fact, even though places like Italy claim it as their own <laughs> and have made good use of it, yes. in fact, those are things that the native people would have had some access to some form of that vegetable, yes. whether it's the way we see it now or Prepare some more primitive sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of the community, do you, would you make great use of these sort of recipes in your daily life? Certainly, the, 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 our community, Santa Rosa, we do um, catering of indigenous foods, um, mostly pastels, and quite a number of cassava bread, cassava farine, that is, that is something that is in demand. We, we, at this point in time at the center, cannot make enough for the demand. Really? Cannot supply. Um, so we are looking at ways of improving and seeing how best we can you know, capitalize on this for a market, a wider market to benefit the community. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, we're always looking for ways to monetize things and that would seem like a no-brainer because I, th I think anybody, whether in the local market, if we saw something that was made by the first peoples, yes. it's something you'd want to buy because you're, you're, you're trying something authentically Trini, really, ultimately very, very Trini. And for tourists, it would be something amazing to take back home. So we are exploring ave those avenues of how we can, how we can get it out there. Yes. And it also allows the community to make a living yes. off of the, their culture and their heritage. Certainly, certainly. Was there at any point in time a danger of the First Peoples' um, culture fading out of existence? Yes. Or has it always been well, thriving? No, there was a point in time, well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The Carib Queen, we have a Carib Queen today. Mm -hmm. The present Queen is Mrs. Jennifer Kassar. But the, Carib, the office of the Carib Queen came on board in the 1800s and that emerged because of the dominance of the Spanish and the church. The culture was in danger. Every, most, of the, most of the practices were dying. And because this woman was a leader in the community and she motivated the people at the time that they should not let all aspects of the culture die and worked with them to preserve certain aspects of it because we have lost quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but we have also retained some. Whatever we have been able to retain is, is, is over time through leaders from time to time motivating their people that they should not let all this go, go, go down. And that is how the office of the Carib Queen came about because she was at that time a leader, motivated the people, and because of her work in the community, was made the first Carib Queen. And we have had that tradition to the present. Until I came on the scene in the 1970s, and um, sought to play a role as motivating the elders, because I too saw, I think what, what attracted me mostly is that I saw a decline in what I knew as a child. You know, as a young child, the festivities, what all the things that I saw, at some point in time you saw a decline in that. So I had this desire to, to, to see it continue, spoke to the elders at the time and encouraged them to continue. So I, I guess from time to time you would see a decline and someone will come along that will try to... to nip that in the bud and yes. sort of build it back so up So I think, you know, that, that contributed to, to the preservation of whatever is left of the... I guess okay. one, of the, one of the sort of the dangers and difficulties in, in preserving a culture and keeping it vibrant um, is when you don't really have a sort of a written tradition That's to follow. right. That's right. I mean, you, just, you've got art, but you don't have a written tradition. A written tradition, for, for instance, is spirituality. Just for the last conference, there was a day set aside to for indigenous spirituality. And I raised the, 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 the question that the Christians have their Bible, mm -hmm. the Hindus have their books, the Muslims, you know, but there is nothing written as a book for the First Peoples because it's all oral and it's passed on. And I, I felt that we are living in a time where the elders and the spiritual leaders, at least of our region, should come together and at least try to document certain basic principles of the indigenous spirituality so that the younger ones can have something to, to go by. Because if you depend only on the oral tradition, definitely you're going to lose out more than what is, what is already lost. So you're quite right in saying that it is not documented. Because as and the older generations pass away and it's not passed along and this orally. Is, yeah. This is why it's important to yes, have people... Yes, plug the book again. To have people water, like yeah. um, Dr. Balkaran Singh who are attempting to no, take this information and put it into... This book is, is available uh, throughout the country, is it? It is, it is available in the Cannes bookstore, I think. Right. 
Ishmael Khan's stores, uh, in Nigel, Nigel Khan. Khan's bookstores. Um, it is at Jadu's in Arima, the Carib Center. It is at Metropolitan Bookstore. And I think we are working on getting it into some other well, We should mention that um, Dr. Balakranting is in the studio as well. So he's yes, he practicing his usual sort of cultural thing. He's giving us prompts from off <laughs> stage left. So anyway, we're out of time, Chief. So I just want to thank you so much for being here. And it's, it's been wonderful talking to you. And, and I hope people get, take, get a chance to sort of buy the book and go through it and learn a little bit about where we came from. Certainly. at the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Chief, a pleasure having you in the program. It's nice. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for being here. Yes. You've been watching One on One. Join us again tomorrow for another edition.